Okay, well, um, hello, good evening, and uh, welcome. Um, thank you for uh, being here this evening. Uh, welcome to Campion College and the 36th Annual Nash Lecture. Um, the stage is set, I think it's fair to say, for a very enjoyable evening after a very enjoyable day for February in Saskatchewan, uh, remarked on a number of times during the day. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it's probably at this stage, the less I say the better, we can get on to more interesting things. So um, I'll immediately call upon uh, Dr. Anne Ward to um, introduce our speaker. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to our NASH uh, lecture this evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Ann Ward, and I'm in philosophy and politics at Campion College at the University of Regina. It is my pleasure to introduce our, Na our NASH lecturer for this evening, Dr. Kieran McAvoy. Uh, Dr. McAvoy has his Bachelor of Laws from Queen's University of Belfast, his uh, Master's of Science from Edinburgh University, and his PhD from Queen's University of Belfast. Uh, Dr. McAvoy is currently a professor of law and transitional justice at the School of Law and a senior fellow at the Institute for the Study of Conflict Transformation and Social Justice, Queen's University, Belfast. He is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and has been a visiting professor at New York University, Fordham University, Berkeley, California, Cambridge, London School of Economics, and he spent a year as a Fulbright Distinguished Scholar in the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. His areas of research include transitional justice, truth recovery, amnesties, ex-combatants, victims, human rights, the sociology of the legal profession, penology, restorative justice, comparative legal studies, and conflict resolution. He has authored six books, the most recent of which are Beyond the Wire, Ex-Prisoners and Conflicts Transformation in Northern Ireland with P. Sherlow, and Judges, Human Rights and Transition with J. Morrison and G. Anthony. Dr. McAvoy has also authored over 50 journal articles and scholarly book chapters, so he's been very busy. Uh, his research has received significant international recognition, including winning the British Society of uh, Criminology Book of the Year Award, the Socio-Legal Studies Association Article of the Year Award three times, most recently in 2012. Uh, in 2008, he was named by Arena Magazine as one of the UK's top 10 young intellectuals for his work on the Northern Ireland peace process. He has conducted research on transitional justice in Cambodia, Chile, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Uganda, Israel-Palestine, Colombia, South Africa, Argentina, Uruguay, Spain, Italy, as well as Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. He sits on the editorial board of six journals, pre previously served for eight years as review editor of the British Journal of Criminology and a series editor for the Rutledge Transitional Justice Series. His current research projects are one, Lawyers, Conflict and Transition, an international research project exploring the role of lawyers before, during, and after situations of repression and violent conflict. Uh, second is Amnesties, Prosecution, and the Public Interest. This project explores the relationship between amnesties or amnesty-like measures, historical prosecutions, truth recovery, and other dealing with the past initiatives in the Northern Ireland transition. In addition to his work in the academy, Dr. McAvoy has a long history of human rights and conflicts transfer transformation activism in the community. He has served as a board member of the Committee on the Administration of Justice, or CAJ, for much of the last two decades. CAJ is an independent human rights organization with cross-community membership in Northern Ireland and beyond. It seeks to secure the highest standards in the administration of justice in Northern Ireland by ensuring that the government complies with its obligations in international human rights law. Uh, he is also a founding board member of Community Restorative Justice Ireland and an active member of Healing Through Remembering, an independent initiative made up of diverse membership with different political perspectives, working on a common goal of how to deal with the legacy of the past as it relates to the conflict in and about Northern Ireland. Tonight, Dr. McAvoy will be speaking to us about truth, justice, and reconciliation, dealing with the past in Northern Ireland. I would like to thank Dr. McAvoy for traveling such a long way from Belfast to Regina, and please join me in welcoming him to, the camp, uh, to Campion College as our 36th annual Nash Lecturer. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Anne, and, and uh, thank you to John and Lee and other colleagues uh, uh, here at Campion for, for this very generous invite. I'm delighted and honored um, to be here tonight. Um, before I start, I should say, uh, historically in uh, Northern Ireland, uh, 
we were very proud of our parochialism. Uh, in fact, we celebrated it. We had two things we celebrated. Number one, our own parochialism. And secondly, the intractability of our conflict. Um, we, were, we, took a, we took a perverse uh, pride in, in both of those things. Um, one of the ways in which we, haven't, we moved out of our parochial comfort zone um, and where our conflict uh, moved towards uh, transformation, at least, um, has been through a process of internationalization. Actually, um, our, our politicians moving out of their own comfort zone and going elsewhere, and also international actors uh, coming to Belfast and helping us out. And amongst the people who made a very significant contribution um, in that uh, were two very uh, distinguished Canadians, uh, Mr. Justice Peter Curry, who I'll talk about later in the lecture, um, who did a lot of uh, very significant work on, on dealing with the past, and also General John de Chastelin, who chaired um, the decommissioning process for getting rid of paramilitary weapons in Northern Ireland, and both of them were, um, made a huge contribution and men of, of um, impeccable integrity um, across, across the piece. Um, the other thing I should say, and maybe John or Anne here in the front row can, can uh, to stop me, a, what, when, when Irish people start to talk about politics, we get excited. And when we get excited, we speak even faster. <laughs> and so if, if you see me starting to speed up or, or just, uh, just, just do something like that and, 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 and kind of uh, calm me down. And if anybody, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a small enough venue, this. If you're having difficulty following what I'm saying because, because of the accent, just put your hand up. North Americans, I think, and, and both in, in the States and in Canada in the past, I've given talks. And I've realized at the end that people got about 30% of what I was saying. <laughs> And they were just too polite to say, you know. So I, I said to John earlier on, I, I read on the, on the plane coming out, you know the big bank, HSBC? They were introducing some uh, software, uh, it was like telephone banking stuff, basically. But they've had to go back to the drawing board in Northern Ireland because the software cannot be designed that actually understands what we are saying. <laughs> it's true. They, they have just given up. I mean, you can imagine the millions that they've spent on this. The software cannot understand what we are saying. So anyway. If, if I'm going too fast, or if you just aren't, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll, I'll slow it all down, okay? So, thank you. Um, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, the talk will be split into three parts. Uh, the first is a, a, a brief background to the conflict. I'm conscious that there'll be people in this audience who know an awful lot about the Irish conflict, and I know there, there'll be people in the audience who perhaps don't know as much. Um, and so, I'm, I'm not going to take anything um, for granted, and you, you'll get a very uh, uh, brief uh, uh, background, enough to make sense basically of, of the conversation on, on dealing with the past. In the second part then I'm going to talk about our efforts to deal with the past and um, what is sometimes referred to as the piecemeal approach to the past. Uh, we, we don't do anything simply, right? So we, we, we have spent uh, the la over a decade negotiating um, how we should deal with the past. We've had uh, a myriad of different individual ways of doing that. And in, you know, in a lot of transitional societies, what you do is you have a truth commission, right? Um, and, and you sort it out with one institution. As you'll find out, we've had about nine or 10 different things on the go at the same time. And now we are compromised and we are down to four, right? So anyway, I'm gonna talk you through the complexity of all of that, hopefully in, in a way that makes sense. And then in the, in the last bit, um, I'll talk about some of the larger themes, um, which may or may not uh, be, be of, of, of relevance uh, in other contexts, and, and perhaps in the question and answer session, we can, we can draw out on, on some of those. So the Northern Ireland conflict. Um, well, uh, one of the issues in dealing with the past is when do you start? What's the start date and what's the cutoff date? For the sake of brevity, I'm starting here in 1969 and up until 1998 um, when the Good Friday Agreement um, was signed. Obviously, violence has continued beyond the Good Friday Agreement. There are so-called dissident uh, uh, Republican organizations who are opposed to the peace process who have continued in, to engage in acts of violence, um, albeit on, a, on a, a dramatically reduced scale. Also, some loyalist violence. Um, and, but anyway, we'll take that period as the conflict, 69 to 98. Our current population is 1.8 million. It's a very small place, for those of you who have been there. Uh, there were 3,600 deaths um, as a result of the conflict, 47,000 people injured, uh, 35,000 people who went through the prisons. What that means is in such a small, condensed place, 
um, huge numbers of families have been directly affected by the conflict, either having lost someone or someone injured or having experienced um, a bomb or something like that, or had family members go to prison. So the, the scale of the conflict um, in, in terms of its ferocity is also it's magnified by the fact that the place is so small and also that the fact that the, the conflict was fought by the working class by and large. So there are particular areas, working class areas, of places like Belfast or Newry or Derry or certain uh, rural communities which are disproportionately affected by that. Um, and so this, the conflict is felt very intensely in, 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 in certain areas. Uh, the population um, has, uh, 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 the, two, the two principal communities, the population numbers have come closer. So in the most recent census like it's, uh, figures, you're now looking at people uh, uh, who 48% of whom would identify as having been brought up Protestant. That doesn't mean they're practicing, um, but they were brought up Protestant. 45% of the population. So it's, it's, it's become um, quite close together in terms of the numbers. And actually, in, in, uh, for the younger generations, actually, it's majority Catholic. So um, Queen, for example, the university that I teach in is a majority Catholic university now. That wouldn't have been the case historically um, in terms of our undergraduate intake. Um, a lot of Protestant um, ki kids actually go to uh, be educated across the water, go to England. Um, and so anyway, it, it, the, the majority of the, of the younger population is, ac is actually Catholic at this stage. So very quick uh, historical background. Um, in 1921, um, following uh, the War of Independence, the country was partitioned. Uh, it was partitioned in order to engender in a, a Protestant majority in the north. So the, from the historical province of Ulster, it was nine counties, six. A border was drawn around six counties within which there was a majority um, Protestant uh, population. And from the get-go, um, the uh, unionist leadership of, of, of the jurisdiction um, saw uh, the creation of the political structures uh, as a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. So at that juncture, the Catholic community was roughly a third of the overall population. Um, but in terms of uh, the way in which the, the uh, Catholic minority community um, was dealt with, um, there was systemic discrimination um, against Catholics in terms of jobs, in terms of housing, in terms of expressions of culture, uh, and in terms of the justice system. So the, uh, the police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, um, uh, was viewed by many in the nationalist community as the armed wing of unionism in effect. Um, uh, they saw their primary responsibility to police the seditious and disloyal minority um, who uh, the, the uh, political culture um, and the political organ organs of the state saw as, um, as, as uh, trying to undermine the, the state, essentially, and, and, and uh, to uh, join with the rest of, of Ireland. Uh, the legal framework um, was such that there was a permanent emergency legislation, um, so the, uh, from 1921 onwards, the permanent emergency legislation, um, which, for example, uh, uh, always allowed internment without trial um, for suspected uh, uh, political dissidents. Um, and, and what you have is, uh, within the parliamentary structure at the time, you have a nationalist party which is very small, um, doesn't really have any purchase or voice within the operations of government, and it's the same at, at local council level. Um, there's significant uh, uh, amounts of gerrymandering within local councils. Local councils would have been in charge, for example, of the allocation of housing, um, and so uh, there was a requirement um, that for... Uh, that people had to have a property, a property um, to own property, basically to get a vote and so on. So the the, the structures of the the state, both in terms of the macro governance structures, in terms of the jurisdiction as a whole, but also at the local government level, were all systemic and, uh, and exclusionary. In the 1960s, significantly influenced by the American civil rights movement, and um, there is a, a, a the beginning of a mass mobilization um, in. Um, seeking an end to discrimination on jo for jobs um, in the allocation of housing and a range of other social and economic issues. Um, but it, these protests, as they were, um, were, I mean, people used to sing, we shall overcome, and you know, it was very heavily influenced, actually, by the American tradition. Um, and, but it was nonviolent. Uh, it was nonviolent uh, uh, protest in the 1960s. What happens, in effect, is that the state overreacts hugely to this threat to its authority. Um, both in terms of the, the way in which the police policed these public order demonstrations, um, but also in terms of what you had uh, at that juncture primarily led by Dr. Ian Paisley, who subsequently became First Minister of the jurisdiction, 
Um, you had counter demonstrations by loyalists um, countering the, 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 um, these, what they termed, uh, disloyal uh, civil rights marches. The unionists were, were con totally convinced that the civil rights movement was a front for the IRA. Um, the IRA, by this stage, was, was a pretty moribund organization in all honesty, there'd been an IRA campaign between 58 and 62, which had been a military disaster. And so the IRA still existed as a structure, the Irish Republican Army, the principal uh, um, Republican paramilitary organization. Um, and so, but the unionists overreacted to the threat to the authority of the state, and the police overreacted. Um, so uh, basically, um, extremely violent reaction to these peaceful marches, um, and also not policing the counter-demonstrations either, so joining with the counter-demonstrations in some instances. And long story short, what happens is that there, the, by 69, it appears that the local authorities uh, have lost control of the situation, and there's an endemic rioting and so forth, and so British troops are deployed onto the streets of, of Northern Ireland to assist the Unionist government at that juncture um, in, in, in to, to uh, regain order, to regain public order. So the army are sent in as a support structure for the police at that juncture. The army um, are uh, treated as in another colonial uh, conflict. So they, the, the troops um, had, a lot of these troops would have had experience in, in, uh, in the British empires uh, um, in Cyprus and Aden, Kenya and other places, and they responded in kind. So they have, they, you know, very brutal tactics, uh, very poor at public order um, issues. They, they, they responded as, uh, you, if you deploy troops into that kind of, uh, particularly urban environment, uh, it was predictable what might happen. And so most famously on Bloody Sunday in 1971, you have 13 uh, unarmed civilians killed and uh, 13 others injured at a civil rights demonstration. Um, and and that's, that's, if you like, the zenith of the army's incapacity um, to deal with the complexities of the situation that, 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 that they've been asked to address. There are three sets of protagonists, basically, to the Irish conflict. The first being um, Republicans. Uh, the Republicans, the principal organization on the Republican side, principal armed organization, is the Irish Republican Army. Um, their, their strategy is to unify the country again uh, and to remove the British presence in Ireland. Um, they regard uh, the Irish people's right to self-determination as having uh, been uh, interfered with by the partition of the country, and they believe that they... they, they used to believe and um, that they, they had the right to bear arms basically in terms of an expression as an expression of Irish self-determination. Their military strategy was to target uh, military personnel, so um, British soldiers, uh, the police, uh, judges, uh, because the judges were upholding British rule in Ireland, um, as well as economic and civilian targets, both in, um, in, in Northern Ireland itself, but also across the water in England, and indeed in some instances in, in, in attacking other British military targets in, in Germany and other places. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years uh, with both Republicans and Loyalists, and, and one of the things that you see in the culture of the Irish Republican Army of the IRA is it's a highly militaristic culture, and so throughout the, this period, um, there is a fixation on the next big weapon. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, I was going to say something about the National Rifleman's Association or something, but it's kind of, it is a, there is a almost Freudian kind of affection, stroke affiliation for kit, for weaponry, um, and it's a very militaristic notion. And in, and in effect, what you have throughout the 1970s, 1980s, they spend a lot of time and energy in trying to get the next big thing, the next big bomb, the, the, the next sniper rifle. You know, if we can just do, if we can just get this, then we can drive the British out of Ireland. Right? That's the, it's a very uh, militaristic uh, 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 view of the world. In the, in, following on from the hunger strikes, which some of you will know, where IRA prisoners, um, uh, uh, 10 IRA prisoners, starved themselves to death in assertion of their status as political rather than um, ordinary criminal offenders. Um, at that stage, Mrs. Thatcher had become uh, Prime Minister in Britain, wasn't very sympathetic to recognition of political status amongst Irish Republican prisoners. But the prisoners, Bobby Sands, the prison leader during the hunger strikes, uh, uh, runs for and is elected as an MP. Um, and what you have then in the 1980s is the emergence of Sinn Féin, the political wing um, of, of, of the IRA. Um, and and the Repu Irish republicanism historic, historically 
it isn't like, for example, the relationship between the ANC and MK in South Africa, um, whereas in the South African context, the political are always in charge of the military. In the Irish Republican context, it's the other way around historically. Sinn Féin has always existed, but the IRA were in charge. The IRA were the bosses. Of Sinn Féin used to be dismissed as the people who sold the newspapers. Um, so they were not seen. It, it was a very, it was a different relationship between a political and an armed wing, with the army, the Irish Republican army, being in charge. Um, and and so when uh, um, uh, Bobby Sands is elected, the leadership then as now Jerry Adams and Mark McGuinness um, of the Republican movement see the capacity for a joint strategy of uh, armed struggle and political struggle at the same time. Um, and and Sinn Féin. It plateaus at a third of the support, basically, within the Catholic community. It, armed struggle, the realities of violence, meant that Sinn Féin could never break through um, that like, one third, basically. You know, th uh, there wasn't a, a significant, sufficient tolerance of, of the reality of armed struggle. You have the IRA becoming, throughout the 1980s, ever more technically proficient at, at mayhem, ever more technically proficient. They, they, they figure out the technology for making very, very large bombs. Um, like bombs, you know, like which can create a lot of damage. So at, at its zenith, they're able to plant bombs in London, which will cause 200 million pounds worth of damage, you know, in one bomb. And in their terms, with minimal civilian casualties, and this particular bomb is two people were killed. Um, and so they're not trying to kill civilians. Of course, they are at the very least negligent when civilians are, uh, are killed. But you cannot, in their terms, in military terms, and I read a lot of bi uh, biographies of former military personnel and so forth, there's, you can see amongst the British military establishment a, a, a significant amount of respect for the IRA as a, you know, a formidable foe. It's very, you know, they are, they're, they're, they're a serious um, military uh, uh, opponent. But they, no matter how much kit they get, how, how, how good they are at, at this, at creating at mayhem and uh, violence and so forth, they can't tilt the axis. They can't drive the British out of Ireland. And there's a recognition amongst the Republican leadership by the late 80s, amongst, with Adams and McGuinness, that they cannot tilt the axis. The British are not going to leave at the end of a bomb or at the end. That's not, it's not working. And so you, that, with that, I mean, I'm summarizing very complex history here within it, but what you have is a, is a, realis a realization at leadership level that armed struggle is not going to do it. And that you're that you're heading towards political struggle. That is the only way forward. It's a very it's a complex that's a complex history. But basically, that's what happens: is McGuinness and Adams managing this transition within the broader Republican movement, where Sinn Féin becomes the becomes the lead partner and ultimately the only partner. The IRA go out of business in terms of military stuff. That's what happens in the peace process. But it's a long and complicated one. The other, the second significant protagonists are the loyalists. The loyalists are, um, the loyalist paramilitaries are there, to, they're determined to defend the union, um, to defend the union with Britain and to defend their community from the IRA. And um, so for obviously, uh, so 90% of the, uh, of the, more than 90% actually, of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the police, um, are from the Protestant community. So when you attack um, a police officer, you're attacking our community as far as loyalists are concerned. Uh, the locally recruited regiment of the British Army, the Ulster Defence Regiment, is 100% Protestant, 100% Unionist. And so again, that is seen by loyalists as you're attacking our community. Um, and they, the loyalists have historically struggled um, in that they, don't rec they would not have historically um, uh, recruited the same calibre of, of individuals as the IRA. Because if you think about it logically, if you want to fight to maintain the Union, you can join the police. You can join the Army get paid for it in a legitimate job. Um, and so they would, tended to, they would have tended to struggle to get the uh, same caliber of recruits. Their targets, um, they would get, they would, obviously they would shoot uh, uh, Republicans or IRA members if they could get them, but by and large they sh they, their targets were the Catholic community, the civilians. Um, and their argument in attacking Catholic civilians, or indeed in planting bombs in the Irish Republic in Dublin and other, other towns, but their argument was that if we put, pr the IRA comes from the Catholic community, if we kill enough Catholics, the Catholic community will pressurize the IRA to stop. It's a simple, asymmetrical argument. Uh, the, the, uh, as we now know, the Loyalists were heavily infiltrated by, by British, um, by the police, by British military intelligence, by MI5, the intelligence agency, and so forth. The Republicans were also infiltrated by the British as well, and I'll come back to that later on. But the, the, so by the, by the mid-80s, mid to late-80s, uh, 
in a recent review commissioned by, by uh, uh, David Cameron, pr Prime Minister, over 80% of targets that are uh, uh, generated by the, the most violent of the loyalist groupings are coming directly from British military intelligence or special branch of the police. So it's a, it's a collusive relationship between the state forces and the, lo the loyalists. They're passing information all of the time. They are trying to write, they have agents within these organizations and they are passing information. In effect, what the, what the British want, what the British military and intelligence people want is they want the loyalists to stop just killing indiscriminate Catholics, but they want them to target IRA people, so they're giving them photographs, addresses, and so forth. But uh, it, you know, they do both. Basically, the loyalists continue to, to. It's easier to kill Catholic civilians, you know. So they, so they are. What you have in the mid nineteen mid, mid uh, early to mid nineteen nineties is the emergence of a very impressive cadre, very small numbers of former loyalist combatants um, who provide significant military and political leadership to their community. They don't have the same uh, strength and depth as the Republicans on the other side, but they provide significant leadership um, as we get into the political negotiations phase um, and in terms of taking the, uh, taking the loyalist organizations towards the ceasefire. And, and they, because they're less in number, um, they're, they, they're high levels of burnout, you know, very, very, a lot of, they, they're carrying significant responsibility and um, these very impressive band of, of former loyalist combatants um, who are trying to lead their, communi their communities out of violence. The third, one of the, one of the, the kind of C minus uh, analysis of the Irish conflict is to focus just on the Catholics and the Protestants, right? That's the C minus answer. The other protagonist, it was a triangular relationship. The other protagonist was the state. The British state is not a neutral in, 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 uh, protagonist in this at all. So the state is directly involved in the practical and ideological struggle. Primarily, it sees its struggle with the IRA. The British state sees its struggle as the IRA. The loyalists are, are different. The state is directly responsible for 10% of death, directly responsible for 10% of deaths. Um, however, we, as we now know, because of the relationship between the state and paramilitary organizations, both loyalist and republican, it's actually involved in terms of collusion um, in a significantly higher number of deaths than that where, where, where they're directing people to be killed or they're not preventing people being killed. It's pretty dirty, dirty stuff. There is a, a de facto amnesty, um, a de facto impunity rather, for state actors there. Um, so of the 350 people who are killed, 352 um, directly by the state, Half of them are uninvolved civilians. Only four state actors ever go to prison um, as a result of those. So, so 352 people killed. Half of them are uh, uninvolved civilians. Only four state actors ever go to prison. And there's a really interesting, like I find it very psychologically rich thing that happens with the British military. So for example, when, when a number of, when two British soldiers are convicted, are given life sentences, they're released after three or four years. They continue to be paid while they're in, and one of them gets promoted. On the, now, the, that's the British military telling us something. You know, it's very interesting. Very, it's a really interesting kind of political sociology of the relationship between the British military and British, British politics. So they continue to be paid, and one of them gets promoted, having been convicted of murder. That's interesting. Anyway, um, the the. Uh, the state responds in a, in a, in a whole range of uh, ways, the way states do to political violence. Use of emergency law, internment without trial, um, introduced in 71, uh, ended in 76, didn't work. Systemic use of torture, uh, so uh, just systemic uh, use of torture right through up until the 80s. Um, uh, shoot to kill an extrajudicial, so set piece killings um, uh, of suspected IRA uh, uh, personnel, and of course collusion with loyalist paramilitaries and to an extent with, with Republican paramilitaries as well. What you have by 1997 is a recognition on the part of the Labour government, incoming Labour government, um, that this isn't working and that there needs to be a, an imaginative response um, to what's been happening with the loyalists and the Republicans. And I, I'll, talk, I'll say some other positive things about Tony Blair in one second. Nineteen ninety-four, uh, the IRA called a ceasefire. The loyalists respond a month later, also calling a ceasefire. In ninety-six, the IRA ceasefire uh, is ended. It's ended with a big bomb in London. 
Uh, the reason the IRA uh, offer for that is that the Tory government, as it was under John Major, which is a very small majority and is reliant upon unionists uh, in, in Westminster to survive, um, hasn't just hasn't responded with any imagination um, to the ceasefire. So when Blair comes in in '97 with a huge Labour government uh, majority, uh, he has he has uh, he has the majority to respond imaginatively and does so. Uh, so by 1998, we have the Good Friday Agreement signed, which formally ends the conflict. In effect, under the under the uh, chairmanship of, of Senator George Mitchell, a lot of support from the international community, as I said, President Clinton, the European Union, and others. The agreement itself um, is is a fascinating piece of political architecture. It does all kinds of interesting things. Prisoners are released. Uh, so part of the con the terms of the Good Friday Agreement were that uh, prisoners belonging to factions um, on ceasefire um, will be released within two years of the agreement being signed. So regardless of how serious the offences that they've committed, and these are you know, often multiple murders, um, everyone's out in two years. It also says that anyone who is convicted thereafter of pre-98 conflict offences, so if, for example, you weren't in jail but you're caught subsequently, you're only going to serve two years. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But, so the two-year was the cut-off point. It was a very big deal, like, I mean, as you can imagine, a very difficult issue to sell um, to uh, victims in particular. Um, we have complex, we have the creation of a human rights uh, uh, commission, we have uh, the incorporation of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights into domestic law via the Human Rights Act, um, we have uh, dramatic transformation to policing structures. We do all kinds of really creative and complicated things constitutionally. It's a fabulous piece of work, really fabulous. I mean, I'm so, so speaks the objective social scientist, but it is. It's a, uh, it, it, it is a fabulous piece of political architecture. Um, the one thing that isn't in it is dealing with the past. We don't have a truth commission as part of it, right? We don't have that. And I've interviewed all the political actors who are involved in the negotiations, and the response is always the same. Kieran, get real. It was hard enough to do it with everything else that was going on. The idea that we would also deal with the past in one go, um, it, it wasn't politically viable. And I think they're right. I, I, I think that's a re perfectly viable argument. Uh, but we didn't deal with it, and we have been dealing with not dealing with it ever since. <laughs> So, uh, zipping along through the politics. Uh, 2006, for the first time in the history of the state, Sinn Féin, the political wing of the IRA, uh, agrees to recognise policing structures. Right? The, 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 this is, a, this is a, in some ways, an even bigger sea change because for the, to recognise the sharp end of the state, you know, the armed wing of unionism, as it historically was, the police, uh, was a f very, very, very formidable step for Irish Republicans to take. And so P Sinn Féin go on the policing board, which is the governance structure overseeing the operation of policing. And this allows Sinn Féin and the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, led by Ian Paisley, to share power. Now, for those of us who grew up during the conflict, the idea that Martin McGuinness <laughs> and Ian Paisley would sit down um, and share power, just you would have thought you were on drugs if somebody had suggested that. It was really, for that to happen, for any of it was, and they became friends as well. I mean, that would, I can't tell you how big a deal that was for us. But again, it's 2006, we're still not dealing with the past, right? The past is not, not, it can't, and again, there's some discussion, well, can we try to do something? It's not happening, right? So it's too big a deal, it can't be dealt with. Um, so how did we, what did we do? What we did, we, we made it extremely complicated. Uh, so we, we set up a, 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 there are a number of public inquiries, and same, very, a public inquiry in our, in our jurisprudence means the same as it does in Canada broadly. Um, I, we had a public inquiry into the events of Bloody Sunday. It cost 200 million, um, but it exonerated the, the, the people who were killed, and, and it laid responsibility for the deaths uh, directly at the hands of, of, the, of the British paratroopers. Um, Mr. Justice Curry, um, who I mentioned in the introduction, was also brought in by the governments, uh, the Irish and British governments, uh, to uh, review and number of particularly controversial killings, including uh, the murder of uh, human rights lawyer Pat Fanukin, Rosemary Nelson, and a range of others, and one uh, and two cases uh, involving alleged collusion between the state in the South, in the, the Republic, in the Irish Republic, and the IRA. And he did recommend a series of public inquiries into these one-off events. So what you're what you're seeing here is piecemeal one-off events being dealt with by a range of, of public inquiries. Our inquest system. The normal inquest system is creaking and groaning with conflict-related cases that have been in the system for 40 years, some of them, and there are 300 of those cases. 
and for inquests are quite limited way of you know in terms of what a judge can or cannot do but they do have quite quite strong uh, compel, compelling powers for the state to deliver information that it has in its own archives. So that has become a big battleground. The IRA were involved in killing and disappearing um, a, a number of people. Uh, there were uh, 16 bodies where the, the families never had the bodies back. We created a structure to deal with that, whereby information um, could not be used to prosecute anyone um, as, as an amnesty in effect. Um, and that commission has worked. Uh, so basically the IRA created its own internal investigation unit and there was a lot of liaison back and forward between this mechanism and the IRA and 13 bodies of the 16 have been returned to the families. But it was, it was, it was, a, uh, it was what it was. It was an amnesty in effect. For a, a narrow amnesty, but an amnesty. Um, we have a, a very uh, robust organisa uh, organisation or institution rather called the Office of the Police Ombudsman. Uh, the first holder of this post was Dame Nula Olone. Uh, and its job is to investigate both contemporary and historical allegations of police malfeasance. So anything where the police are alleged to have been involved in, for example, murder, torture, or other things, um, this organization does that investigation. It also has very strong uh, policing powers. It has the same powers as the police themselves in terms of uh, investigative arrest and so forth, also compelability, getting access to f intelligence file and so forth. There are 300 cases in that, um, going back to the conflict. The former chief constable, uh, Sir Hugh Ward of the police service in Northern Ireland, uh, took a very bold and, from my view, an imaginative step in setting up a big cold case review. You guys have cold case reviews here, I imagine, in policing structures where you look at an old case. Um, and so they, he established a mechanism called the Historical Inquiries Team to do that for every, every conflict death, right? A massive undertaking using contemporary policing and forensic techniques to go back and look at all of these old cases. Not necessarily with a view to prosecution, because prosecutions are extremely difficult to achieve, and I'll come back to this um, for historical cases, but more in order to provide as much information as possible. Every family member for a HET case receives a report, from, and, the, and that report is uh, designed to, as much as the state can in terms of, obviously there are responsibilities to protect life, so you can't, no one is named in these in these reports but you can get a lot of information and sometimes that's what families need for closure um, and using contemporary policing techniques the HET was wound up in 2013-14 because basically it was failing to deal properly with cases involving state actors um, it was not it, bas it, it was failing um, to to deliver those because it's not in, it's not an independent mechanism it was reporting to the to the chief constable and therefore in in cases which were uh, uh, dealing with uh, for example the army um, or in, uh, in other cases where there were collusion um, allegations it was fail it failed to, to come up to the benchmark in terms of the required level of independence and was actually wound up because of lack of public confidence. But it was still a, an interesting, I'll come back to it. And also we've had loads of community stuff going on in terms of oral history archives, and lots of energy within civil society, right? So all this, this is a really complicated, sometimes if I'm doing a talk like this, I would do a diagram, but the diagram became unmanageable. I couldn't get it all on one slide. Um, so it, anyways, so narrative is probably better. It's a, it's a complicated piecemeal approach to the fact that we haven't dealt with this. So big picture, right? Coming towards the last bit now. Um, I mean, four efforts to, 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 to broadly do a big picture, try to solve, but let's try to uh, bring it all together. First was the Civil Society Initiative. Uh, the organization Healing Through Remembering did a big piece of work uh, uh, suggesting options for dealing with the past in Northern Ireland. They, they brought in a lot of uh, comparative analysis and produced a massive report and blah blah blah. Um, I should I should suggest I should admit I wrote it. So <laughs> I have a dog in this fight, you know. Uh, but anyway, we did a lot of work and blah blah blah. 2007, Tony Blair set up a, a group called the Consultative Group on the Past. Uh, there's two gentlemen in the middle picture there. Uh, 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 Dennis Bradley, who's a former Catholic priest, um, and Archbishop Eames, who's a former um, head of the Church of Ireland, so Catholic and a Protestant clergyman, um, with a group of other civil society people. So Blur, Blur appointed them. And they spent uh, 18 months doing extensive consultation. And they came up with a, a version of something that the Healing to Remembering organization came up with the same. And, and they're very upfront about, you know, nobody's starting from scratch here. You borrow on what went before. Um, and they proposed a legacy commission. You know, it's like, I think if it, 
walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So it was like a truth commission, basically. But we, did, we couldn't call it a truth commission, so we called it a legacy commission. Anyway, that body, that failed because of a recommendation contained in the body of the report that all, all the family members of anyone affected by a death in the conflict should receive a £12,000 legacy payment. Um, and that included, for example, the mothers of IRA personnel or loyalist people who had been killed. Um, because the, the uh, consultative group in the past thought that it would be too invidious to distinguish the grief between of one mother versus another mother or one uh, par uh, partner versus another and so forth. That was a political mistake. It, the, 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 uh, that piece of work got torpedoed below and never recovered, basically. So even though they pulled that bit out very quickly, but it never, it never recovered from that. So we have another goal in 2013. Uh, we bring Richard Haas, he's uh, uh, an American diplomat, and Megan O'Sullivan, also an uh, American State Department, together, and it brings together the local, primarily the local political uh, par parties for intense negotiations on a range of uh, legacy issues, including dealing with the past. The British and Irish governments during these negotiations took a back seat. Uh, for, people, for some people like myself, that was an abdication of responsibility, uh, and it was a mistake, a political mistake. So they did seven drafts. I have each draft. Uh, I'm the only nerd in the world who cares. You know, it's, <laughs> you know, you know, like you're looking around your study and you're thinking, what am I doing with all of this? I have all seven drafts, and uh, of course they're all confidential. I shouldn't really say that. Anyway, uh, uh, six months of negotiation, seven drafts. This proposal, there, Hass and O'Sullivan draw on the consultative group in the past, which you know, so it's a what's that word, palimpsest? You know, like it's drawing on what's over overwriting what has gone before and they, they can't reach an agreement. You're seeing, you're, you're seeing a theme here. <laughs> the, the, the news is getting better here. Hey, 2014, we have another set of intense political negotiations. This time the British and Irish are stepping up to the plate. So the two governments are now properly engaged in the process. They're properly engaged and taking responsibility. Um, and, and what comes out of the Stormont House Agreement are four mechanisms, the four mechanisms um, I, uh, I mentioned at uh, the start. So we're all, we're, as I say, like, think about this as a kind of a disaggregating of a truth process, and you, have, you create four different mechanisms, right? Historical Investigations Unit, uh, which is a, uh, a body to take over the work that was done by the Historical Inquiries team, but with more independence, right? So recognizing the mistakes that were made in the Historical Inquiries team, police-led cold review of the remaining cases, and any cases that weren't done properly by the HET, but cold case review um, by, the, by the police. Uh, by, by, by police. Uh, a body called uh, the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval. Uh, this is a, a, a mechanism which draws on the disappeared commission process. And the idea is, in effect, to give, to create a space whereby if, if victims want more information from, for example, the IRA or the loyalists or state actors, um, you, you, you set up a structure whereby the, the victim can feed into this process. There is a, a response then from the, from the organization and no one, no one can be prosecuted for the information that comes out of this narrow process. It's not a general amnesty. It's a limited immunity from prosecution. Um, and and the, the limited immunity from prosecution only refers to that process. So for example, if your fingerprints are found on something else outside of this process, or forensics, or whatever, people can still be prosecuted. Uh, and it, it, it's, a, it's a clever way around. Basically for unionists uh, in particular, and for some, element, some elements of the nationalist community, the word amnesty is a, is a, is a no-go. can't be done. You can't go there politically. Uh, so had, uh, we had to find creative ways of getting around that issue. And actually, we, 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 a number of us who were working closely on this, these issues came up with a way of framing this, which made it as British as Finchley. Um, Maggie, Th Maggie Thatcher once famously said in terms of uh, uh, that Northern Ireland was as British as Finchley. And so one of the issues around framing some of these issues is if what, if, if, if what you do looks too much like transitional justice, that is a, that's, a, that's a, for some elements, particularly in the unionist community, that's a no-go. But if you can frame something as, actually this is as British as Finchley, it's nothing to do with all that whatever transitional justice is, foreign stuff, 
this is as British as Finchley, and, and what we found was that there is a legal tradition within British public inquiries uh, going back to the early part of the 20th century that you will have limited immunity from, for, it's, it's about the privileges against self-incrimination, so that, you know, so uh, train crashes or boats that sank or those kind of non-conflict related t stuff, there's always some version of a limited immunity from prosecution, and so we framed it that way, limited immunity from prosecution, not transitional, British eventually, everybody was happy. So anyway, well, not happy, but workable, workable. Workable consensus emerged, this was doable. Um, the establishment of, a, of an oral history archive uh, to allow a space for storytelling and to allow uh, 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 people to capture their narrative, personal, familial, or social narratives. Um, and a body called the Implementation and Reconciliation Group. Again, the... Uh, the issue here in the negotiations has been a contest over who gets to write the history, who gets to write the narrative of what happened during the conflict, because we have binary opposite views of what happened during the conflict um, between nationalists and unionists. There's binary and the British. So there's three different versions of what happened during the conflict. And so the compromise around this was to create a body. The body is, is made up of political nominees, right? So it's, it's the one space where uh, academics, we like us lot, um, we, we were seen as, as neutral. <laughs> Uh, so this, the, the, the Stormont House Agreement actually stipulates that a group of academics, independent academics, will report to another body and will be involved in writing the big picture narrative. And it will draw on the evidence from the other mechanisms, for example. So you've got, you'll have information coming out of the uh, Historical Investigations Unit. Um, you know, so these reports, obviously, will be in the public domain. You will have information coming from the, the uh, um, ICIR, the Oral History Archive. All of this, then, narrative, then academics do what we're supposed to be good at. We take all of this data, all of this information, and we pull it together, and we, pull it, we make it uh, thematic. We look at themes, and themes can be generated. So one the an obvious theme is collusion. is a big theme in our conflict. But another a theme, for example, that, that a lot of uh, a, a unionist and um, uh, politicians and activists are, are interested in is for, for some they believe that the IRA was involved in a in a deliberate campaign uh, of ethnic cleansing as they term it on the border areas to drive Protestants out of farms basically of who owned land and so that that would be another obvious theme another theme you would expect would be on gender and gendered vi gendered violence um, would be in any kind of truth recovery process nowadays so anyway the themes are there to be generated so this is it the four bits of it are are, are all meant to intersect we're almost there, right? We have, we, we're getting so close to the wire, getting us over the line, everybody's getting very excited. Well, you know, those of us who care are getting very excited. We're getting really, really close to the line. And then, <laughs> there's a lot of slips between lip and cop on this stuff. And so, the, 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 uh, my understanding from sources close to the negotiations is that the British government attempted several times during the political negotiations to have the word national security included in the Stormont House Agreement, i.e. that the government would be able to redact information that would be provided to families on the basis of protecting national security. Having failed to get it into the agreement, sources close to the negotiations tell me, when the British then introduced legislation, they introduced, they were, uh, they drafted legislation. I should say that the, myself and others, we drafted our own version of legislation as a kind of counterweight to the official legislation because we'd been caught before that, you know, you th what happens is basically it's, it's life. You're, the in, political negotiations are so intense, the deal gets done, everybody goes, ah, you know, what happens then is the rats get gnawing at that. And, and so that, I, sorry, that's a terrible way to describe civil servants, <laughs> but the civil servants get drafting at it. And then you see the sections and the subsections, you go, what? How did that from that agreement end up in that? Because we'd been caught before, we instructed parliamentary council, and there were about seven or eight of us uh, from uh, both universities and, and uh, the local human rights NGO, and we had our own. We drafted our own legislation, we launched it in, in the House of Lords, and so basically it allowed civil society and political actors to see our, what we hope, progressive version of the legislation, and the British legislation. And ours didn't include the term national security at all. You know? um, we talked about Article 2, which is the, the European Convention on Human Rights, protecting lives. You know, so that I, you cannot provide information to a family member that might result in them being attacked. Nobody gets named, obviously, in any report, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But national security is a very nebulous term. It doesn't have a particular legal meaning, and that's why civil terms like it. Because uh, you know, you it's not legally defined. So anyway, we are now at the situation where we are trying to find creative ways of squaring this last bit of the circle. Um, and I, I can maybe talk a bit more in the Q&A on that. That's where we are, right to truth versus national security. But if we get this one done, then we should have legislation on dealing with the past introduced in Westminster. 
in, in September, October. We're in the election cycle at the moment. There's elections happening in the north. There's elections happening in Dublin. You may have noticed uh, that British uh, politics is quite obsessed with whether or not to stay in the European Union. So you could two ways of reading that. You could think this could, this could be quite a good time to slip something through. There's <laughs> 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 a lot of stuff happening, you know. It's kind of <laughs> uh, that might be what, or, or it may be difficult to get the, the different institutions like, lined up to get this bit done. Okay, so I'm going to finish now on the, for about five minutes. Is that all right? Like just to do some more thematical stuff. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm not going to go into the detail on all of these. We can do it. In <laughs> I like that picture. <laughs> So the, the three big themes, justice, truth, and reconciliation. And these are themes that are potentially of relevance in other contexts. So what, what, do we, what, what have we learned? Uh, <laughs> I skipped a lot of stuff. <laughs> have you ever, any of you ever seen the Coen Brothers movie, uh, Burn After Reading? You know the Coen Brothers? Yeah. Do you know what, at the very end of that, it's a brilliant, it's a very complicated film, but at the very end of it, the leader of the CIA is talking to his friend, and he, and he said, so what have we learned after all of this? And his friend goes, I'm damned if I know. <laughs> so, so we're at the, what have we learned phase now? You know? So what have we learned after all these twists and turns? Um, on, the, on the issue of justice, I think we've broadened the conversation at home away from justice as being seen it's simply synonymous with prosecutions. As I said earlier, the Good Friday Agreement um, requires that no one's going to serve, for, for pre-98 offences, um, no one's going to serve more than two years anyway. What that means in practical terms is that if, you are, uh, if you're prosecuted for conflict-related offences um, and, say, you're held on, uh, on remand, there is a chance that it takes a while, I, I was reading something in the paper here, you, uh, I think you have issue as well with remand, people who are not sentenced, you can be held on remand. There's a, there's a real chance that when, if you go through a court case, you've been held on remand for a while, you could walk out of court the same day as the victim, even though you've just been sentenced. Because if you spent two years on remand awaiting trial, you, you, your release could happen on the same day as you're sentenced in effect. And so what that has required is, is, is having very delicate, sensitive uh, uh, conversations with victims about managing their expectations um, and, and about what, uh, what to expect from all of this. The other reality, the legal reality, is that there will be very, very few prosecutions in any case. Eyewitness evidence is unreliable from years ago, so any decent, any decent lawyer will, will uh, take a co coaching horses through that. The IRA um, blew up the forensic lab, right? So as you, as you know, like you, if you want to make a case on forensics, it's got to be a clean uh, chain. The evidence chain's got to be clean. And I know if I were a lawyer representing someone, so there's a lot of BBC footage of the, the, the lab when it was blown up. They put a very big lorry full of explosives outside it and they blew it up. And so you have all these bits of paper floating about in the wind. I know I would put that video on if I was, if I was defending someone on a historical charge and say, you think, does that look like a clean clean chain there of, you know, look at the, the evidence is blowing in the wind, literally. Um, the IRA also blew up a lot of police stations, which also held forensic exhibits. Also, we know that if, if there are agents involved and there are agents all over the place, prosecution always falls apart. It's the state actors are involved. So all of that to say we have had, I think, a, a quite a grown-up conversation about the meaning of justice in these contexts. Whether you're talking about some kind of symbolic censure, some family members want to hold on to prosecutions, even if it only means someone doing two years, and even if they recognize that um, uh, it's only going to happen in a very small number of cases, and that's their right. But the, the, the broader public conversation has been um, to, to broaden what do we mean by justice. And so we, where, we, where we've got to, I think, in these conversations, are to, a lot of conversations now are about the right to truth, um, about knowing, about maximizing the knowledge um, that people have about the circumstances um, within which uh, uh, their loved ones died. I know I've, uh, there are philosophers in this room, so I'm going to tread very carefully here <laughs> on this stuff. <laughs> I am, I am but a humble lawyer. <laughs> uh, there are obviously uh, different versions of truth. There's a lot of literature in the transitional justice literature and in, in, in philosophy and other disciplines on this. Um, there are 
personal or familial truths, my truth, what happened to us, you know, people talking about the experience of loss and pain and so forth. Um, and that conversation uh, uh, has, has, has come up a lot and, and, and needs to happen. There's forensic truths, actually knowing what happened, uh, materially, empirically, um, what happened in a particular. Social and political truths, I, I'm very interested in these, these versions of truth. What happened to our society and why? One of the difficulties in, in our very piecemeal approach is that it's quite difficult to pull it all together. It's quite difficult to see the bigger themes and patterns because you have this atomized version of lots of little forensic truths running around at the same time as, as families and communities have their version of the truth of what happened to them. And so pulling it all together, the bigger social and political truths um, about what happened in our society and why did, how did this happen? How, how did we get to this stage where we were killing ourselves and each other at this level, this level of horror and violence in such a small place. And so all of that, anyway, we, we, I think we've had and con are continuing to have much more grown-up conversations about the complexities of the notion of truth and, and, and what it means. The reality, however, and that's uh, uh, exemplified in, in the in design of the ICIR, is that in order to engage in this question of truth recovery, you have to have a conversation about immunity from prosecution. It's just a reality. Um, uh, the Attorney General, our local Attorney General, a um, uh, uh, couple of years ago proposed that there should be a general amnesty. Uh, I'm not even sure that's lawful, uh, but uh, he proposed there should be a general amnesty. And it, oh, it was a, it just it was a, 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 a lot of noise created as a result of that. Actually, it was, we were working on these, these issues around immunity and so forth. It was, it was really good politics for us because we were able to say we wouldn't go so far as the Attorney General. <laughs> He's clearly some crazy lefty. <laughs> Whoa, that's, far off, that's off the chart for us. But actually, there are other ways in which you can think about limited immunity and blah, blah, blah. So it was a very useful outlier for us that, 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 that he made that intervention. Overall, uh, where, where I've ended up on this, and I was an agnostic, to be honest, when I started working on this, um, it, uh, I, 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 uh, borrowing from, from another Canadian, Michael Ignatiev, uh, Ignatiev talks about, in, in a very small piece, actually, about truth recovery, but about narrowing the space for permissible lies. Not, rather than having some... Over, rather than over, he doesn't quite say this, but this is the way I've interpreted it, um, rather than overselling the product of truth recovery and what it can bring uh, to, a, to a, a context like our own, um, to, to think about it in more narrow terms about narrowing the space for permissible lies. Because one of the, re one of the ways in which we were able to kill each other for so long um, is because we had lots of permissible lies. Th th we had these binary narratives about what was going on. We were the victims, they were the perpetrators. Um, and actually narrowing the space for that to happen. When, when Bloody Sunday, when the report, the Savile report came out, for example, there's one particularly right-wing uh, unionist MP at home whose, whose argument has always been um, that, uh, well, this was an illegal march. So in those days, you had to apply to the unionist minister for home affairs in order to march at all. And funnily enough, he never gave permission to anyone to march if it was a civil rights march, or very few. So, you know, it was illegal, therefore. You know, so it, because it was an illegal march, his argument was, therefore, it was legitimate to shoot 13 civilians, and blah, blah, blah. Now, that was a morally offensive argument. It was always a morally offensive argument. But the thing that struck me, and he held that line uh, after Savile reported, and it, it looked like what it was. It was no longer a permissible lay. It just was intellectually, morally, and politically uh, untenuous, you know. And, and, and that, so for me, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we oversell all of this truth recovery stuff, but narrowing the space for permissible lies, either at an individual, a familial, a communal, or a political level, I think that's okay. I think that's, that's, that's a big enough one. Um, and the final one, uh, I did a paper, uh, I actually wrote it with my ex-wife. Uh, it's called reconciliation is a dirty word. <laughs> <laughs> we were not an ex at the time. We were still, we were still a couple at the time. But we, we did a piece uh, uh, together. She's an educationalist. And uh, I, I, I was doing that, th that book on ex-combatants. And there was a guy who was a former IRA uh, combatant who's done a huge amount of reconciliation work, as I saw it. You know, a lot of work and outreach to loyalists, outreach to British Army victims, really walking the walk in terms of dealing with the after effects of conflict. And so I was doing an interview with him for the book, and, and he said, uh, I was talking about reconciliation. He said, I think reconciliation is a dirty word, Karen. That's really interesting. But you're someone who's practicing this, like, you know. And so it got me, got me thinking. One of the reasons why I think reconciliation is a very problematic term in, in the Irish context is it because it's too, it, it, it's too easily reducible to 
why can't we just get Catholics and Protestants together and, and you know, why don't we just, if we could just deal with, you know, the religious connotations to the conflict, and we could just get the Catholics and the Protestants to get on, we'd all be fine. Now, if you're the British state in the middle of all that, you're very happy with that notion of reconciliation, you know, that's, it's kind of classic a-structural bias, you know, you're very happy with that notion that just, if we could just make these atavistic tribes love each other, it would all be fine. Um, so for me, I'm a human rights lawyer, I think the state has to be at the center. And so in our, our version, the kind of stuff that we've been doing and thinking about reconciliation um, is that you have, a, you have an equivalent focus, not simply on breaking down. Of course, breaking down sectarianism or prejudice is part of the bigger process, but you need a similar uh, uh, careful eye on what the state's up to, um, on the state's legal responsibilities, on attempting to create a... a human rights guarantees, but also to transform the way in which we intersect each other. We don't need to love each other. It's, it's part of what I think, to be honest. But we have to respect each other's rights. And we have to respect each other's rights, not just our, our, our simple rights, our, our European Convention of Human Rights, rights, um, but actually our, our rights to be different, and our rights to have, have competing identities. And our, uh, you know, we just have to respect those. Uh, if, if we don't all love each other as a result of that, that's fine. So, but, so in, 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 in some of this work, what we've been trying to do is talk about creating conditions for political generosity um, and, and, and thinking about that through. And, and, and uh, anyway, so I can, I can come back on that. And part of this as well, there's a lot of thought going on at the moment into the role of acknowledgement and apologies. There's a line and a half in the Stormont House Agreement that talks about uh, in the context of the work of all of these mechanisms, the British and Irish governments will consider statements of acknowledgement and will expect others to do the same. Line and a half. Um, what that really means, that was that was pared down. It was the earlier versions, <laughs> the seven other drafts, was loads and loads of stuff on that. And where, what, what that is looking like, in the re well, uh, for, for some of us, what we hope it looks like, is that you would be looking at statements of acknowledgement, probably choreographed, between the British, the Irish, the IRA, loyalists, perhaps some institutions, the churches, a range of others, where you would choreograph the delivery after much consultation with victims and affected communities and others, and you choreograph um, a, a, a broader acknowledgement of what went on and how we hurt each other, and, and you craft that into, and uh, so anyway, it's, some of us are hoping that that line and a half of text can be expanded into something a lot more imaginative, but we'll see. I'm done. Um, the, so what does it require? It requires political will by definition. It requires resourcing. It's going to cost significant amounts of money. It requires legal imagination. I spend, I'm a lawyer, but I spend a lot of my time beating up lawyers. Um, and with good, for good reason. <laughs> of, of all professions, we need a good briefing. Um, but it requi this, this process has required significant legal imagination, actually. It required lawyers to step outside of our comfort zone and to think creatively about how to, how to resolve um, these issues. And it's required sticking at it. I mean, people have been, you know, we didn't, 1998 was a Good Friday Agreement, you know. It's now 2016, you know. Um, it's, 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 it's required a degree of, of, of durability. But, uh, but that's Martin and, and, and Ian, uh, Lord of mercy on them. Um, and they, they did not, by the way, they, 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 didn't, they didn't pose as John and Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> But I think it can be done. Like as I said earlier, if those two can become friends, like it, it, this can be done. Okay. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.
upholding that. But what has it meant for the legal profession in terms of reflection or, or chaos or identity as they are involved in crafting and move through this process of truth, justice, and reconciliation, but also, of course, I can reflect on their role during the conflict. So get in the conflict. Sure. Did you still have a question at the back? That's all you've got. Me? Yeah, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll try to make mine brief. I, I like what you have to say, especially under uh, reconciliation. There is that uh, ongoing here in Canada, the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee Commission, which is speaker tomorrow night. Um, my, my question is it, about your point about two tribes. And, and to some degree, that's what's being betrayed here. It's unfortunate. Between white and non-white. Mm -hmm. Yet within the Aboriginal people, or the Indigenous people, there's a there's, uh, non-retribution. We just want the truth you know, to be brought up. Mm -hmm. And then you go on to say, make sure um, what happened in the past is not to be reproduced in, in the future. In other words, why was it done and um, not to um, reproduce it again? Um, sure. My question to you is, where does Northern Ireland, I'll just add one thing about here, where does Northern Ireland go in the future? Is there still a deep sectarian difference between Protestant and Roman Catholic? And can Northern Ireland ever merge into Ireland? And my point here is it's coming. And this is part of the reconciliation and getting away from too much and not reproducing the past. There's talk among some of us that we want the Constitution of Canada open. We want the two founding peoples be done away with. And that you draw upon the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples and you have uh, anywhere from 40 to 45 indigenous nationalities. And what we're, what's I'm quite likely to move towards, that's why I asked you about mm -hmm. joining together, is that there be declared um, for historical reasons all these nationalities including Aboriginal and European, that no two peoples are the real nationalities of Canada, and the others, the indigenous population, are the racially subservient. So, okay. I, by the way, I was in Belfast in the mid-1970s with uh, sandbags and pillboxes, right. British troops, and it was an open-air site. <laughs> I've been back a few times. Okay, uh, so, uh, okay, I'll go so I'll start here to, to lead in from this one into that one, I think. But, uh, so the first question on the, on the, the 32 counties of Ireland, uh, um, well, the first thing to say is that uh, if, if, you're a, if you're from a unionist background, the percentages I gave there uh, um, mean, in effect, that if you want to maintain the union, um, then you have to attract support from Catholics. And, and so... I think within elements of unionism has had some soul searching around how to get middle class Catholic buy-in to a unionist uh, political uh, uh, identity, and, and there's some way to go on that, I suspect. But that's that's the obvious, you know, that the, the reality is with a younger Catholic population coming through, there is a, 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 a if you're a unionist, I'm not a unionist, but if you're a unionist. Um, and you're you're seeking to uh, uh, make the union attractive. You have to attract Catholics to that, or ultimately people will vote in the other direction. And, and, and uh, under the Good Friday Agreement, a, another referendum can be triggered. Um, and so Sh Sinn Féin, for example, uh, which is now I think it's got about 70% of the Catholic vote now, um, a would like to trigger another referendum in circumstances where I think they c they think they can win it, um, or at least keep trying to keep pushing the referendum button. Um, until they get it. So, a, but there's a bigger question, I think, which relates a bit to your, your com I, I, it's not simply about the, the, the constitutional status. I mean, you, you know, a bit of legal imagination is possible to think about how, what a, a, an All-Ireland legal 
uh, architecture might look like in terms of constitutional change and you know, two chambers, one in Dublin, one in Bath. Th that could just require a wee bit of legal imagination. But that's all doable. There's a bigger set of conversations that need to happen, however, about back to the reconciliation issue, which aren't, which are maybe below the surface. For example, we were uh, speaking earlier. Um, Martin McGuinness, for example, uh, ran for president in, this, in the 26 counties in the Republic uh, in 2011. And it opened up a lot of old wounds, which was quite interesting in McGuinness's run. And McGuinness is the most popular politician in the North by a country mile. Like, so he's got approval ratings through the roof in the nationalist Catholic community, but also significant levels of approval in the unionist community because he's seen as, a, as, as someone who has genuinely uh, led republicanism to where it's at now. And so he's respected, I think, across the piece. What was interesting was the level of anger and vitriol that was directed against McGuinness in the South, in the 26 counties when he ran for president. And one of the things that struck me around all of that was that there are actually, there's reconciliation work to be done, not simply between Catholic and Protestant, not simply between um, uh, 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 people living in the Republic and unionism in the North, but actually between the, the uh, 26 county Republic and Northern nationalists and Northern Republicans. There's a big piece of work to be done. So yes, we can do the legal architecture, um, that, that, that's possible to design that. It's a hearts and minds issue, obviously. Uh, people uh, who are nationalists need to be persuading unionists and others that their rights would be respected, their identity would be respected, and so forth. So in the same way as unionists need to persuade nationalists, and that's fine. We're not killing each other over it. We just need to you know, hold our political positions and, and, and try and persuade the other that, that they're safe. But that's, those conversations need, will continue to be had because the numbers tell us that. Like that's, the, that's the reality. A uh, second question about a uh, South African experience, and thank you for, for feeding your own direct experience. I've, been, I've done a lot of work in South Africa back and forward, and I, I think as you probably know, um, uh, South Africa played a huge role actually in our transition, um, that uh, one of the uh, contributions uh, that, that South Africa did uh, it was that Mandela lent his own personal support to bringing unionists and Republicans out to South Africa at one juncture. And at that stage, this is how, how bad relations were. The, the, the unionists were insisting that they should have a separate toilet than the Republicans because they weren't speaking to Republicans at the time. And, you know, I, I was a, a, a friend of mine who's in the NC and was involved in, in setting up these discussions going, you can't really say that in South Africa. We've had a bad history of that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't play very well, you know, that separate toilet thing is not a brilliant way of selling your, politi your political project. <laughs> on the specifics on the, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and your, your, your misgivings about that, I think, are, are well placed. I think uh, all of us who are involved in this, so I, I've interviewed quite a lot of um, victims and former combatants and people who are involved in the, in the TRC. And the key issue, I think, that perhaps Desmond Tutu, uh, for, I mean, I, I have a lot of respect for Archbishop Tutu. He is a little bundle ball of charisma like I mean he's, I've met him a couple of times he's, he is just walking charisma etc but and part of it's his personality but I think that there was on a political level there were two elements and you touched on one of them one was a pressure to forgive or a pressure towards reconciliation which I think the, the example of your illustration was a very good one about you know people being pushed to hug and you know the the um, case uh, uh, with Winnie Mandela it's very very I'm very uncomfortable with that sort of pressure to reconcile pressure to forgive um, and, and 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 that's I think that's that's a problem and the second I think was an overselling of the product I think the TRC the product was oversold you know that this would deal um, with uh, the after effects of apartheid. This would, de this would reconcile um, South Africans. I think learning from that experience, uh, those of us involved in this work in Ireland need to not oversell our product, n not oversell the reconciliatory potential of truth, not oversell the prosecutions, not oversell the product, basically, to let's manage people's expectations in a calm and sensible way and, and, uh, in, in terms of all of this. So I think the South African ex experience is very, speaks directly to that. Third question on, on lawyers. Um, I, I, I wrote a paper which I can send you if you're interested called What Did the Lawyers Do During the War? Um, which, uh, uh, so I interviewed quite a lot of lawyers and, and uh, for most, most lawyers, the people who are involved in, in the conflict related work are a small, small percentage of lawyers. So, so uh, there hasn't been a huge amount of soul searching is in the legal community at home. Um, either amongst lawyers or amongst judges. Uh, I've just written something actually there a couple of months ago suggesting that the judges themselves, basically one of the interesting things that the TRC did that I liked is that it wasn't just about the human rights violations, there were also institutional hearings into different aspects of, 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 of civic and political life in South Africa, and one of these was on the legal profession. And, on, and, and, and as you probably know, uh, there were hearings on 
uh, the racist uh, structures within the VAR and the lost cities in South Africa, but they also invited, they didn't compel, they invited the judges to come along um, and to, make a, to, to uh, talk about what happened. And the judges, my view is a mistake, uh, the Chief Justice uh, uh, subsequently said uh, the, that it was a mistake, they, they refused to come. They said it would uh, uh, compromise their independence, judicial independence, that they were seen to be accounting for previous decisions. Um, and that wasn't what they were being asked to do. They were asked, being asked to reflect as an institution about the role that they played as an institution. I think part of that soul searching is what we need to be doing in Northern Ireland as well. It is not simply the 18 year olds with the AK 47s that are our conflict. Our conflict was much deeper than that, and it involved structures, institutions, like the legal profession, like the judiciary, all aspects of our society. So the soul searching isn't just about the 18 year old with the AK-47, it's about the other institutions and structures that contributed to us slaughtering each other for three decades. And so reflecting, the, the, our legal community and our, our judges reflecting on, on whether they uh, stood up to, for example, promoting the rule of law uh, during the emergency law. That, those are, I think those are perfectly reasonable questions to, for judges and lawyers to have to, to have to ask. And one of the suggestions that certainly I would make is that the ICIR, the body that's going to pull together the themes, that would be a perfectly reasonable theme. What did, role did the legal community play in all of this conflict? What role did the churches play? Um, that Those are perfectly reasonable themes, I think. Um, and the final point, I won't go there on the Canada thing. I, I'm looking forward to the judges' lecture uh, uh, tomorrow night. Um, the, your, your question was, uh, the question on the Northern Ireland aspect was whether uh, the, the, the sectarian attitudes persist within uh, 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 Catholic and Protestants. Um, these are durable attitudes. You know, sectarianism is a deeply rooted aspect. It was institutional in our, in our context. Um, I, you know, I, I, I suppose if I look at the, uh, if I look at your, uh, the, my under, undergraduate classes that I would be teaching now, they're, they're, they look and feel a lot different than we did. Uh, well, I was at Queen's uh, 85 to 89. It's a very post-Anglo-Irish agreement, very difficult period. Um, I was laughing to John earlier on. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, in those days, uh, expressions of Catholic identity um, or, uh, or uh, nationalist identity um, were, would have been frowned upon. You were, you were making a statement. So on Ash Wednesday, for example, I'm from a Catholic background. So on Ash Wednesday, we would have had a big, huge <laughs> Ash you Wednesday. Know, you know, it was like a political statement. You know, I probably hadn't been to Mass in two years, but you know, Ash Wednesday. <laughs> you know, so uh, it, it just seems less uh, problematic. Though the, the, I mean, people, you know, it, it, it just see it, it's the the a younger generation coming through. Identity seems to be just more relaxed, you know, in terms of who they are. It just feels to me, as someone who's no longer young, um, it just seems like a, a more relaxed identity. So I, I I can't answer sociologically whether those deeply ingrained attitudes um, are around. I, I can't say that just the feel of the university, for example, as a shared space in our community, it just feels differently. But they're obviously, you know, these are. Uh, educated kids and stuff, so it's a, it's a complicated question, that. Um, but as, a, as I said in the, uh, in the point on reconciliation, for me it's a, it's a deeply ingrained thing, and, and you know, it, it, people, people can dislike each other because of their religious background, that's fine, but I just want them to respect each other's rights. You don't have to love each other. Um, so. That's very uh, I'm not sure what's in there. It's like uh, the Oscars. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like the Oscars, yes. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, so, again, thank you very much for an excellent... Pleasure, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the only final thing...